Ready? Okay, this is day 10 of our recovery. I've been told I lose track of time. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, answer a bunch of different questions from people about our recirculating and, uh, system and plant system. Uh, but before I do that, I want to bring you up to date on things. Uh, we've been, we kind of took the weekend off a little bit. Uh, uh, Susie and I went Friday night to uh, one of our Grand Brats uh, uh, track meets uh, and got to see her run. And then Saturday we went to our youngest Grand Brats birthday party, third birthday party in Austin. And all we did in the greenhouses over the weekend was basically feedings and walkthroughs to make sure things were okay. Uh, but today, this morning, we processed two of the 300-gallon breeding vats in this greenhouse. We're in greenhouse one right now. Uh, we processed uh, vat number uh, 1D01, which is uh, Protomelis tinealatus, uh, common name Red Empress. It's a cichlid, a mouth rooting cichlid from Lake Malawi. Uh, we found about 50% survivorship uh, in the breeder vat, less than that in our uh, one to two inch, two to three inch, and male and female vats. We lost our two best breeder males, and there's a short video uh, uh, that'll also be posted of me sorting through uh, breeders, and I'll talk about that in that video. Then we did uh, one DO2, uh, which is uh, our Red OB California Dragon Bloods. Uh, it's a peacock. Uh, they're descended from a batch of, of uh, Dragon Blood uh, peacocks that we got from a shop in California when I was out there speaking at uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco clubs. We decided to drive out because we were taking a bunch of fish uh, to the clubs. and. Uh, we picked up some fish while we were out there. I brought them back and we've developed several color strains from, uh, from those. Uh, uh, regular dragon blood and an OB dragon blood and from the OB dragon bloods a red OB. Uh, we lost our really nice big male but we, have a we had three uh, pretty good younger males. We, uh, beefed up the breeding colony, put those three young males in. I think I have about 35 females for them. And they're set up and uh, be ready going into our uh, major breeding time of the year, the first half of summer, which will be starting in the next week or so. Uh, by the way, uh, today's high temperature happened at about six o'clock this morning at 70 degrees and it's now uh, about 54 degrees. It'll go down in the 40s tonight, uh, but then start recovering tomorrow. We'll be back in the 80s uh, in a few days. Uh, kind of typical stuff, not, not anything that bothers us. We're ready, we're prepared for that. Uh, so now we're going to do our recirculating and plant system, and they're, and they're really one and part of the same thing. We're going to, this is vat number uh, 1E01. It's a 300 gallon uh, uh, breeding vat for uh, uh, Cyanochromus friary, also called Electric Blue Ali's. And you'll see a two inch water line with two spigots uh, running. Those are each putting in roughly 50 gallons an hour. And so the water runs in. Part of our plant filtration is this. This is Ceratophyllum demersum, uh, hornwort. Uh, this is a plant we got from a, uh, a, uh, a nursery just outside the French Quarter in New Orleans years and years ago. I like it. It's a real green uh, plant. Each one of these growing tips uh, in our system grows about an inch a day. We throw away at least 25 pounds of this a day because it gets, uh, sooner or later it clogs things up. And uh, uh, it's kind of the workhorse. It removes a lot of ammonia from the system. And one of these days I'm gonna do a uh, uh, back of the envelope calculation as to how much 
uh, uh, ammonia it takes out a day. Uh, so we have it in, in the vats. It's kind of first stage plant filtration. Okay, now once the water runs into the vat, it overflows uh, out of the vat. Uh, these tend to clog up. Usually there's uh, a lot of times a mystery snail. You can see the mystery snails back over there sometimes clog them up. And a hobbyist uh, who saw one of our videos recommended that we use some of this aquaculture netting uh, uh, coiled up and stick it in there and it would stop plants and snails from, from clogging it. I'm going to do that three or four years from now I'll, I'll just let y'all assume that I thought of that uh, but, uh, uh, but actually it was in a comment from a hobbyist. Okay so you can see the water flows down into our floor gutter. The floor gutter is four to six inches deep it is the bottom of the greenhouse is a uh, pond liner aquaculture uh, pond liner that goes from rail to rail and, you know carl's picking up an edge sometimes there will be a toad under there they like uh, like that so it flows into this floor gutter which goes about 80 feet uh, to that end of the greenhouse the south end of the greenhouse and the 55 gallon vats also flow into it. it and as we get to the other end you'll see the quite a current developing uh, so the water flows down and you note that this water is clear this is a greenhouse uh, on a sunny day this is bright sunshine the water doesn't turn green why doesn't it turn green because all these plants are sucking out the ammonia before the uh, single cell algae can. You see a little bit of algae on the white pipe there, uh, but that, that's not free-floating algae, that's a, a, a surface algae. Uh, you note that there's not a lot of debris on the bottom. This is actually uh, uh, mostly calcium carbonate. That's a piece of calcium carbonate. Our water is rock hard. It's 285 parts per million calcium carbonate. If you drop uh, drip a faucet you end up with stalactite and a stalagmite and this forms in sheets on the sides of the vats and breaks off and makes kind of a, a sand. Uh, but the water is crystal clear. Okay so we walk along. Uh, oh and there are usually a lot of feral fish in here. There, there's some mollies and guppies over here. Uh, used to be a lot of cichlids. We lost 80 90 percent of those to the uh, when water temperatures in the greenhouses drop to uh, 55 degrees Fahrenheit about 12 degrees centigrade uh, uh, for several days uh, see there's a mystery snail trying to uh, clog up my overflow there and you can see water flowing and if you look at the side of that you see uh, that's some duckweed, algae, uh, and calcium carbonate sheets uh, from the water cascading down. Also, it smells like you ate a dead fish. Uh, we've gotten most of the dead fish out, but occasionally one floats up. We normally would like to uh, keep the duckweed down a little bit. It's kind of a pain when you're feeding, but we're, uh, we are keeping all the plants going. Now that vat Carl's filming right now is uh, a scud vat. Uh, we raise scuds and I have a whole lot of questions about how we raise scuds and how a hobbyist might be able to, to do it on a smaller scale and we will probably do that video later this week. Uh, especially since I've got some scud orders that need to go out and I'll show how we harvest the scuds. Uh, oh here by the way there's a young cichlid that didn't make it. Oh so? Fish. Under normal circumstances we lose several fish a day because we usually have around a quarter of a million fish. And uh, I don't retire breeders. Uh, I, I like keeping older breeders. Uh, 
uh, in hopes that they continue to reproduce, which selects. Uh, if you're always turning your uh, breeders over when they're young, uh, you're, bas you're not selecting for longevity. So I like to select for longevity on the fish by uh, keeping, letting older breeders breed as long as they can. That's a, yeah, another, that one's been dead for a while. Maya, you want to fish? Maya's a little pickier than Oso. I'll give it to Oso in a minute. Uh, this, by the way, is a black mangrove, which is uh, native to the Texas coast. Uh, used to be restricted to down around Brownsville, but as the climate has warmed up, it's all the way up uh, around New Orleans now in Louisiana. Uh, of course, the recent freeze may have taken care of that. Uh, this is actually an F1. We collected propagules uh, a few years back, uh, planted them, grew them up, and they bloomed two years ago, and this is the result of uh, uh, one of those. Uh, it has these interesting aerial roots and because it grows in uh, very uh, stagnant con uh, uh, conditions, low oxygen conditions, they put up these aerial roots that collect oxygen from the air. Uh, so we follow this down. This is a uh, Central American herb. Uh, 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 scientific name is Pipo aretum. It's in the pepper family, believe it or not. Uh, common name is Ojo Santa. Uh, and it's used in cooking. They make moles out of it. Uh, the leaves are used to wrap fish or other meats to, and to impart a, uh, uh, what is the smell? I think licorice. Licorice <laughs> smell. Uh, I don't cook. Uh, but uh, this pulls a lot of ammonia out of the water too. Uh, it's a little bit annoying as you see over here. We're getting ready to chop this row out because it's starting to push pipes around and block uh, water overflows. So we have to cut it back every once in a while. Uh, but it, uh, it does a good job. And by the way, in Austin and in Houston, that leaf is 50 cents to a dollar. And uh, I've been, uh, Susie's supposed to be developing us a market for it, but so far that hasn't happened. Uh, that's been going on for several years now. Uh, she claims she has too much other stuff to do. Oh, so you want to fish? Oh, so it's not as picky. But you can see that this is growing roots uh, through our overflows and stuff. It's, this all has to be chopped out. We, there are a bunch of bats here we can't use because of that. Of course, we haven't been using all of our bats because we were still recovering from Hurricane Harvey and hadn't got, gotten back up to full production from it. And then we have this disaster. Uh, so the water continues flowing down here past all these plants. This, these two plants, are, they're kind of scraggly, are red mangroves. Uh, we got those uh, in 1997. We got propagules from Key West, Florida. We were still in, uh, our hatchery was in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the time. We grew them in the greenhouse. They like to make a big tree and I don't like them for one reason. That is they're host to a uh, uh, moth caterpillar that locally is called an asp. It looks like a, about an inch long hairy teardrop. If you ever touch one, you never, you never want to touch another one. But we, we used to have a bunch of these uh, and I ripped them out because uh, uh, they were loaded with these caterpillars and we'd brush up alongside them and get uh, not only sting, uh, stinging, but all your lymph nodes would swell up, you'd throw up. It was, uh, it's an unpleasant uh, little caterpillar. Uh, so you can start seeing as we get down here uh, the water flow. This is the edge of the floor gutter. And you can see the water flowing over into, that's a four foot deep sump. 
I do see some cichlids down there, so we did have some sump fish survive. Uh, there, there's some Maya, you're going to fall in. So the, if we had followed a water droplet, it, go into, it went into that vat, overflowed out, into the floor gutter. Maya, don't tear things up. And now it's ended up in the sump. And if you, these, we have six pumps like this, above ground pumps. Uh, each one of these pumps, uh, about 6,700 gallons an hour. Uh, that's 6,700, I think, uh, as somebody said in an earlier video that I said 67, but it's 6,700. Uh, and there, the intakes are, you can see that pipe going into the water and below that is a uh, aquaculture netting cage to stop the fish from getting sucked up in it. But well, there's more fish in there than I expected. They look hungry. Yeah, they do look hungry. Uh, I'll have to toss some, some stuff in. Oh, so you're going to fall in. And so each of these pumps pumps uh, uh, over 6,000 gallons and it goes out this into a four inch manifold and there are lines that go out to each one of the vats. The lines connect at the other end of the greenhouse so it forms a, a circular loop just to balance the load. Uh, this is some more uh, Piper Aretum. And oh, this plant is Defenbachia. My, my mother had this little scrawny plant uh, that her cats kept scratching up. And I put it on the edge of the, the uh, gutter and it it grows like mad unfortunately it's worse than poison ivy you can touch it like this and it's not a problem but if you get the sap on you it's worse than poison ivy uh, so I, I'm going to try to control it interestingly enough Placostomus and Ancestrus eat these eat the stems if they're in the water uh, you throw a piece of stem show you one of the stems here. You throw, cut off, uh, cut a chunk of that stem and throw it in the water, the ancestors and Placosmus eat it. Of course, right now, I think we've lost all our ancestors, but it looks like probably 70% of our Placosmus have survived. There's a, call if you come up over here, you can shoot over there and see a, a, a larger cascade of water. And the water flow and the, uh, uh, especially where it flows over that lip, adds a lot of oxygen to the water. We used to, you'll note that we don't have any airlines. Uh, uh, there, there are some abandoned airlines, but we're not, we took out all of our air blowers. We found that the, the aeration from the water flow is more than adequate, uh, that uh, having air blowers was, uh, 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 an unnecessary redundancy. Uh, so we did away with our air blowers, saves a lot of uh, electrical power. These above ground pumps are fairly efficient uh, electrically. We are looking at installing at some point solar panels uh, to uh, help reduce our electricity costs. That's uh, electricity and food and employees are our primary uh, cost in raising fish. You can see between the bats there, uh, there's a school of mollies and sword tails, feral fish living in sump. Uh, used to be a lot of cichlids, but they didn't survive as well. And if you watch, they're swimming against the current. So that's how the this works. The greenhouse too is just like this. Uh, the uh, same uh, same arrangement. Uh, Aeration is provided by the water uh, flowing in, splashing, the water running over the lip into the, the sump, uh, just the general motion of the water. The, uh, you notice there no mechanical filtration, no ozone, no uh, UV. Uh, all the filtration is provided by these plants sucking uh, ammonia out. Under normal circumstances, our ammonia levels are zero. Uh, oh, here, here's, 
interesting. Here's a one of our big lacostomus died. Oh, there's a live one just swam next to that. Here's a skeleton. So that rotted in the system and uh, with all, with approximately well over a ton of fish we pulled out uh, of the uh, both systems so you know at least a thousand pounds of fish per our ammonia went up to one part per million at one point it's now back down uh, uh, getting close to zero uh, certainly below toxic levels now and that's the action of the plants the plants have it's kind of a double whammy we had uh, a couple weeks of no sun so the plants weren't photosynthesizing a lot uh, cold temperatures and a lot of dead fish rotting uh, made for kind of a perfect storm for increasing ammonia but the plants are catching up now uh, but see the bulk of that placostomus rotted away already we didn't notice it for those of you who've watched some of the other videos there are videos of the uh, of us taking bucket loads, you know, tractor bucket loads of fish out, dumping them and feeding them to the uh, local buzzards and two species of buzzards, the black vulture and the turkey vulture, uh, as well as Mexican eagles, which by the way, when I was a kid, long, long time ago, I'm 70 years old, uh, uh, we didn't have Mexican eagles. We didn't have green jays, we didn't have great kiskadees, we didn't have uh, whistling ducks. You had to drive 250, 300 miles south almost to Mexico to uh, to see those birds. Today they're here all the time. Uh, so if, for, if you don't believe in global warming, you haven't been watching uh, what's happened in nature as tropical species have been expanding uh, uh, in the northern hemisphere northward. and. Uh, that's true of plants. The uh, wee satch, which is a, a very common tree now up to Waco, uh, we were at the, when I was a kid, we saw a few wee satch in Goliad County, uh, but that was about it. And so, uh, it's a, uh, a cold sensitive uh, plant, uh, and it's now expanded uh, close to 300 miles north of here. Uh, over the last 50, 60 years. Uh, black mangrove, which we talked about earlier, has expanded its range. Red mangrove has expanded its range from you know, the southern tip of Florida almost to uh, uh, Georgia now. And that's not because it's changed, it's because the climate has changed. And it uh, a, it's a tropical species that's now able to thrive that far north. This, we were trying to get, and I'm going to figure out some way of filming it at some point. Uh, this is how we collect uh, paramecium if we want to feed the little the tiny fry. Uh, the mom on the bottom of our vats uh, is loaded not only with nitrifying bacteria, nitrosomas, not. Uh, nitrobacter and, and others, but also uh, things like paramecium, uh, cyclops, uh, the fish, little fish can pick through them and eat them, but uh, you know, basically they, they have a lot of cover there. So when I want to get paramecium, I simply take a 10 inch brine shrimp net, uh, scoop up a bunch of gunk off the bottom uh, of, of a cichlid breeding vat, dump it in a five gallon bucket, three or four inches of it, fill the bucket up with water, let it sit overnight and come back and the paramecium or milky swarms, kind of cloud formations in, you know, in the bucket and just pour them off. Uh, and, but I have yet to figure out a way of filming those milky clouds. It's uh, uh, an interesting. I am trying over there, I, this morning I set up a blue bucket thinking maybe uh, in a blue bucket the white uh, clouds would show up. We'll see later today. Anyway, that's that's it. It's simple. It uses plants and moving water, uh, turning over uh, 
a 300 gallon vat every uh, uh, two or three hours, a 55 gallon vat more frequently than that. Uh, the falling, falling water uh, oxygenates it and, and uh, uh, aerates it. We don't have to use any uh, air blowers or, uh, 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 to aerate the water. It's, it's done kind of naturally like a waterfall. Uh, by the way, the first system like, like this I ever set up was in an apartment in Austin actually a duplex, my spare bedroom, I set up a, a two before rack with 30 10 gallon aquariums on it, three tiers. I uh, had leveling siphon, I had siphons between, uh, between all the tanks and then leveling siphons at the end. So the water, I had a pump that would pump water from the, the end uh, 10 gallon tank up to the top. It would run through that, run through the next one, then down to the lower tier, go through all the siphons. And I had on the lower tier, I had a bunch of lights and hornwort and house ivy, pothos, uh, which I, the roots were in the water and I trained it up over the, uh, the, the aquariums. And that was my first recirculating system using plant filtration. I didn't have any other, any other filters. I didn't have any aeration. Everything was just the water flow and plant. And when we started this business in the, uh, uh, the mid-90s in, in Santa Fe, uh, I decided we we're going to do that. We've gone through uh, an evolution but, uh, to, to this particular system, but in concept it was the same thing. If anybody has any questions about it, shoot me an email at charles at goliadfarms.com and I will try to answer it if it's a uh, general enough, I'll, uh, interesting enough, we'll do a video on it. Uh, thank you and good fish keeping.